Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the 2021 Legislative Wrap-Up Webinar. This presentation is being recorded, and the presentation materials will be available by the end of the day at www.cml.org under Training Materials. For those of you who are not familiar with the GoToWebinar platform, you should see a control panel to the top right of your screen. There's an orange arrow to the left of that panel, which will minimize the entire box. Uh, all participants have been muted for this webinar, but we encourage you to ask questions by typing them into the question box on the control panel. We will hold a Q&A near the end of the webinar as time permits, so please feel free to type the questions in as you think of them throughout the presentation. At this time, I would like to hand things over to Carrie Daggett, Fort Collins City Attorney and Chair of the CML Attorney Section. Thank you, Courtney. Um, as Courtney noted, I'm the City Attorney up in Fort Collins, and I've had the honor and pleasure of being the Chair of the Attorney Section this past year. Um, I am um, here today to start us off um, by introducing uh, a pair who many of you are quite familiar with and who many of us rely on for um, sort of up to the minute uh, information about what's happening down at the Capitol and all kinds of other legal issues throughout the year. Um, David Broadwell, CML General Counsel and Laurel Witt, CML Associate Counsel. And I'm going to turn this over to them uh, to do the legislative wrap, wrap up for us all. And should note that at the end of the Scheduled time today, we will be having the business meeting for the attorneys section, at which time we will be electing officers for the next year. So I would invite all of the attorneys uh, who are here online to stick around for that part of the event today. And um, I'll turn it over to David Broadwell with that. Thanks, Jerry. And uh, <clears throat> thanks for everything you did for the attorneys around the state in the last year uh, witnessed a lot of it and uh, a lot of it's behind the scenes. So, so thank you for your service for sure. Um, and welcome to everybody uh, who's here to join us for all or part of the next couple of hours. Uh, we have a ton of material to cover. Um, I gave a presentation like this a couple of weeks ago and an audience member asked, is there anything the legislature didn't do in 2021? And I just laughed because I, I didn't have an example because they covered so much. Uh, and we're going to talk about a lot of that today, but not everything. Uh, I want to uh, note for everybody in the audience, just this morning, you would have received from CML our Laws Enacted publication produced by our entire advocacy team, covering lots more bills than we're going to talk about in the next couple of hours. So anything we're not uh, saying here, you'll be able to get more information uh, from that book, which uh, should be in your email this morning. Uh, if not, uh, contact us and let us know. Um, the other thing I wanted to do first is some important acknowledgements. We're, we're going to have a big audience here today. I see folks are still checking in, um, but I want to give a shout out to Sarah Werner, our engagement and communications manager, who coordinates all this sort of things, these sort of things with her staff, and particularly Courtney Forehand, the voice you heard at the top. Uh, Courtney, this is her last day at CML. She's done a great job for us the last couple of years helping with webinars like this, doing a lot of work behind the scenes in terms of our event planning, sponsorships, associate members, and so on and so forth. Courtney's moving on to new opportunities, but I want to thank her. She's helped me a lot personally uh, in terms of getting more accustomed to doing these kind of presentations. So thank you, Courtney. Um, and, uh, and most of all, uh, uh, Megan Dollar and her entire advocacy team they're the ones that do all the hard work that's reflected in what we're going to be talking about here over the next time uh, over the next period of time and uh we have some successes this year some big successes uh but a lot of it was challenging because there was just so much and so much of it was so big in terms of its implications for the state and for municipalities and other local governments so they deserve combat pay every year but especially this year because of the volume of the issues that were out there, including some of the things we're going to be talking about now. Um, so, so before proceeding, here, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about state ballot issues first, uh, because some of the things that may be on the ballot in November uh, segue kind of through the back door into some key legislative uh, topics, particularly fiscal topics. Um, but after talking about the November ballot, 
will lead off with a lot of Tabor and fiscal and tax policy issues, uh, some of the big important things that happened this year. And, and then at the end, I'm going to talk about all the big things related to police reform, criminal justice reform, another uh, huge dominant topic this year. And in between, Laurel and I will be talking about a lot of the other important news for you to know about uh, or for, to take, take note of if you haven't already. Uh, so so uh, without further ado, let's talk about the November ballot uh, a, a little bit, both at the state level and at your level. And I clicked on my screen. There we go. Okay, so just uh, the lay of the land, of course, going into November of 21, we're up to 60 municipalities now that you, know, you all know that's your biennial election date. A lot of ballot issues on, are going to be coming forth from you all. Um, the long-term trend, a lot of municipal, home rule municipalities have been switching to November odd year, and we know there's other conversations going on out there right now and some of our larger members about uh, maybe heading in that direction at all as well. But 60 municipalities, of course, all of you are going to, had the opportunity to refer questions to the November ballot as well, and, and a lot of Tabor questions. Uh, we always, at least this has always been my philosophy, it's good to know what's at the top of the ballot, potentially, that uh, your questions are going to follow, to understand what the voter will have seen first before they get down to your questions. And that's the point of highlighting a few things for you here this afternoon about what's happening at the state level. Here, here's a key thing that is going to tie into some of my comments. The only state questions that qualify in odd years are Tabor questions, tax increases, debrucing or revenue, revenue uh, retention measures, and debt, debt and multiple fiscal year obligations. All other state ballot questions can only occur in general election years and in even numbered years. Only Tabor questions can happen in odd years. And I'm gonna show you some interesting maneuvering that's been happening for folks who are determined to get on the odd year ballot and make their question a Tabor question, some interesting uh, tactics that are being used these days. We will know by August 2nd what uh, is likely to appear on the state ballot, because that's the deadline for folks to get in to the Secretary of State, anything um, that they have teed up and in the pipeline. So the first three bullets on this slide are the three topics of potential state ballot questions that are floating around out there and in the pipeline. And I'll come back and talk about each of those in turn. Um, I, I note on here, waiting in the wings for 2022, a list two tax reduction measures, uh, the income tax and sales tax. I should have listed a third. There's also talk of a gas tax reduction measure that's going to be initiated for next year in, re, in, in reaction to the all the transportation fees that were adopted this year. So we're, we're seeing this significant trend. I'm sure some of you have noticed this. Even though the Democrats control elective office in Colorado, in the Capitol and other statewide offices, um, when folks in Colorado vote on ballot issues, they often tend to vote conservative fiscally, even while they're electing progressive and Democrat candidates. Uh, there's a real schism in terms of voter behavior in Colorado right now. And conservative groups like Colorado Rising State Action, certainly the Independence Institute, they're picking up on this. And I watch for an, in uh, an uptick now in terms of fiscally conservative tax reduction type measures, uh, both this year and in the coming years, as this trend is likely to continue. So let's talk about the three that are out there. Let me first say this. I checked in with the Secretary of State's office yesterday. The three potential state ballot questions we're talking about, all of them have campaign committees. All of them have received a million bucks, right? So we know they're serious in the sense of being real in terms of actually having a lot of money behind them, at least in the, in the seven figures. Um, but, um, but whether they make it, whether they get enough signatures, we don't really know. This first one, 5% marijuana tax increase, You've probably seen uh, former Governor Ritter, Governor Owens are, are assisting with this. I, th I think this is definitely real. Uh, it's hard to pass uh, an education-related uh, tax increase in Colorado unless it's a sin tax. And as you all well know in your own communities, uh, taxes on marijuana, on nicotine, on gambling, they pass even when everything else doesn't. So the proponents of this have gone the sin tax route. Uh, I know a lot of you are probably going to have your own marijuana taxes on the ballot. 
If so, be aware that there'll be a, bill, a likely state marijuana tax increase uh, that appears on the ballot before your own question. This is kind of an esoteric issue uh, that uh, some, some of the lawyers in the audience are probably aware of. I worked a lot on the issue of custodial funds when I was working in Denver strong mayor form of government. But when money drops out of the sky, comes from the outside federal funds, grant funds, and so on and so forth, or even a big lawsuit payout, uh, who gets to decide how that money is spent? Uh, and this measure is designed to shift power away from the governor and to a certain extent away from the AG, the attorney general, and say that custodial funds henceforth, like big relief dollars, uh, uh, the future infrastructure dollars we might get from the feds, they have to be appropriated in the future. Amend the Constitution, amend the statutes to empower the legislature with the appropriation authority over those funds. If you were watching closely over the last year and a half, a lot of the COVID relief dollars, there was an interesting dance going on about, does the governor control the expenditure of that money or does the General Assembly? And I think behind closed doors, a lot of uh, compromises were worked out in terms of avoiding a outright power struggle over that question. But this is a proposal to definitely shift power to the General Assembly and make all that money subject to appropriation. Notice it's a combined constitutional amendment and statutory amendment. So it'll need 55% to pass uh, if it does make the ballot. And also if they're getting signatures, and this is serious uh, with the amount they've invested in it. They've got to collect signatures from all over Colorado, not just in the King Supers in, in Denver. Uh, they have to get they have to get them from Senate districts all around the state. Uh, now, here's something I alluded to earlier. The, the drafters of this amendment included included debrucing language in the amendment. So all this custodial uh, money in the future will be debruced. And I believe the reason they probably did that is they wanted to qualify this for the odd year election ballot, for the 21 ballot by including debrucing language, even though that's not the main purpose of the measure. And it's all about kind of gamesmanship in terms of qualifying it for the odd year ballot. And I think we're gonna see another example of that just now. Uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the third and final one, we're gonna talk about for the potential November ballot. This is a biggie. And it's extremely interesting and complicated in terms of some things that have shaken out just in the last few weeks. So this is uh, all that business about uh, property taxes in your community, how much a property gets taxed. And you all are up familiar with these ratios that have been around for a long time, where nobody gets the full value of their property tax. Only a fraction of your property value gets taxed uh, with uh, ad, ad valorem mill levies. And when the Gallagher Amendment was taken out of the Constitution last year, we knew this was going to be possible, that, that these ratios that have been around forever will now be set forth in statute. Uh, and it'll be possible for the legislature or even the uh, uh, initiative petitioners to go for reductions in those ratios year to year. Who knows uh, how often it might occur, but it would politicize the conversation over whether those ratios go down in the future. If those ratios go down, it affects your tax base uh, in terms of your ability to apply your mill levy and derive a certain amount of revenue from the tax base in your community. So this is really important stuff in terms of the viability of your property taxes. Now, last year, the General Assembly, when they referred the Gallagher repeal, they adopted a moratorium, an open-ended moratorium. No, no changes for the time being to those ratios. The moratorium lasted one year, uh, and now uh, everything has changed as a result of what I'm about to tell you. So there's there's a measure proposed for the ballot potentially um, in November that I'm, I'm showing you the literal ballot question language that was included in the petitions that are probably out there being circulated for signatures right now. And it would cause the first, uh, the first highlighted phrase here, a $1 billion reduction in property tax revenue around the state of Colorado. That's what the state fiscal analysts came, out, came up with as the likely effect of reducing the assessment ratios as shown in this ballot question. But here again is what I talked about a minute ago. Early versions of this proposal, we're just gonna kind of stop there. Reduce the ratios, reduce property tax revenue, reduce the burden on taxpayers locally to a very great degree by passing this measure. In later drafts of the proposal, they added this language in green. Uh, we're gonna reduce property taxes by a billion, but we're gonna debruce 25 million in state revenue to help them make up for some of the impact. 
that's kind of ridiculous when you think about it, a billion dollar hit with $25 million mitigation. But I truly believe the green language was added, again, precisely to qualify it for the odd year election ballot, because that's debrucing language, all right? And so by including Tabor language in the measure, they managed to qualify it for the uh, November 2021 ballot. Uh, and I think it's kind of a token thing, but it's effective legally in terms of playing that game and getting on that odd year ballot. Now, uh, here's where it begins to get more interesting. Um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, a couple of key things. A major decline if this if this measure were to go forward as originally proposed and were to pass because once the ratios go down they can't go up again uh, because Tabor says there can't be an increase in the assessment ratios without a vote of the people and another thing that is really pertinent to this audience is that now that it's become evident that either at the ballot box or at the general assembly there's going to be manipulation of these uh, these assessment ratios more of you might want to think about what we've been calling D Gallagher questions floating mill levy questions for your own voters. Uh, we had several municipalities do this last November. Uh, going forward into the future, you might want to consider it in your community. The idea here is that if something happens with state property tax policy at the state level, it causes your local property tax base to go down, you can flow through mill levy up to at least stay even in terms of your property tax revenue. Uh, and uh, a lot of special districts have done this. More municipalities are getting on board. You might, some of you may be thinking about it already, but just heads up on that, uh, that that's a lesson that we're learning from what's going on um, over the last few months with, uh, with this whole issue. But here's where it really begins to get interesting. Um, in the last six days of the session, in June, in the last six days, a bill was introduced uh, uh, on the issue of property tax, taxes and assessment ratios that does many different things, does many different things. But one of the main things it does is to blunt the effect of the initiative that I was just talking about and to make sure that uh, maybe if it's going to be a hit on property tax bases around the state, it's only a couple hundred million, not a full billion. Uh, but more importantly, to basically, to basically take the initiative rewrite the underlying statutes in a way that the initiative itself, even if it's adopted by the voters, will not have a billion dollar hit. Um, I reviewed a draft of the Blue Book uh, that would, is being prepared for November uh, at the state level, and the Legislative Council staff is already having to explain and prepare to explain to the voters in the Blue Book that even though this ballot question says a billion dollar reduction, a yes vote will not produce a billion dollar reduction. It'll produce something less because the underlying law has now been changed by the General Assembly as a result of the adoption of SB 293. It's a kind of a very bizarre scenario. The ballot language will not actually describe what the effect of an approval vote will be as a result of the change in the underlying law. This happened once before, years ago, when the tobacco tax was adopted back in 2004. Uh, some old timers in the crowd may remember this. There was a kind of an undermining of uh, part of that ballot question by the General Assembly in between the time the title was set and the time the voters voted on it. Um, but it was different in lots of ways from what's going on this year. Um, but you're going to see that the media really hasn't paid a lot of attention to this yet. But if the matter makes the ballot, there's going to be a lot more colorful conversation, shall we say, about why the actual question on the ballot doesn't match what the real fiscal effect of a yes vote will be. Uh, so enough, uh, let's see if I've got anything else on that. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna turn to something else, which is also fallout from what I talked about earlier, about the increasing tendency of tax decrease questions to appear on the state ballot. This one was uh, actually had a full two weeks of debate in the General Assembly before it was finally adopted at the very end of the session. It's a move to have the legislature tell the state title board what language to actually put in certain kinds of fiscal ballot questions. Now it talks about uh, tax increases, it talks about tax decreases, it talks about tax measures that might affect local tax revenue collections and so on and so forth. But I think the main thing 1321 was designed to do was particularly to require language 
in tax decrease questions in the future at the state level, tax decrease questions must advise the voter, if you say yes to this decrease, these state programs will be affected, that services provided for this and for that and for this and for that will be negatively impacted if the tax support is decreased and actually put that right up front in the ballot language that the voter would see. Um, and this is unprecedented, like I say on the slide, uh, and it's unique in the sense that uh, one of the things, there's already laws out there that say, frankly, uh, ballot questions are supposed to be brief and they're not supposed to speculate a lot about what the effect of a yes or no vote will be right in the language of the question. The question is supposed to be brief and matter of fact. Um, and this kind of goes against the grain of that tradition in terms of dictating to this degree ballot language in the future. But you're not going to see it on the November ballot this year, but this will affect potentially um, tax de decrease and other fiscal measures on future state ballots. A really interesting approach um, developed by the General Assembly, undoubtedly designed to deal with the phenomenon I talked about a minute ago with more and more of these fiscally conservative questions appearing on the statewide ballot. Uh, I laughed when I read this headline back on Memorial Day. Uh, Colorado Public Radio says, the year the Democrats left Tabor behind, billions in new spending can cut through tables, Tabor's fiscal firewall. And I put a little footnote on here uh, because as I, I always, Tabor is always with us and there's no such thing as leaving Tabor behind. So this was kind of a hyperbolic uh, headline from my friends over at uh, Colorado Public Radio. And then just a couple of weeks after that headline, the June state fiscal for, uh, forecast came out and it painted an entirely different picture. Uh, uh, those of you who've heard me babble on for years know that I like the term, the heartbreak of excess revenue. That's what the main thing Tabor gave us is something to worry about. And that's something we never worried about before when we have too much revenue, but Tabor uh, creates all sorts of caps and governors on too much revenue. And I started using this term a long time ago. Well, the Legislative Council told us in June, in their June forecast, suddenly a complete like 180 from where we were. If you put your mindset back in the early days of the pandemic, we thought that we were going to be in fiscal crisis for years to come. State revenue would be well below the Tabor caps and so on and so forth. Huge turnaround in terms of, and, and no, no bigger turnaround than the first quarter and the second quarter of 2021 in terms of how all the forecasters at the state were looking at this. So, so we are back in a, by next year, a $1 billion Tabor refund obligation for the state um, as a result of all sorts of factors uh, related to uh, state revenue. Uh, so no, no longer are they going to be below the line, they're going to be well above the line. In my experience and our experience, once they're above that line and in the refund mode, they stay stuck there for a while. So it's not just two years from now, it's uh, going uh, into the future potentially. Just last week, Governor Polis vetoed a bill uh, kind of at the last minute uh, in terms of a bill that would have further incre increased state uh, registration fee uh, revenues in a way that would exacerbate the Tabor refund problem. Of course, there are lots of other bills that had already been signed into law that are part of the problem now, the heartbreak of excess revenue uh, that weren't vetoed and have been signed into law. But the, the state obviously this session and next session are taking notice of this, is that new revenue is gonna just drive more Tabor uh, uh, refunds unless the revenue is sheltered in an enterprise and is not subject to the Tabor refund obligation. But it was interesting to, to hear and read Governor Polis's veto letter on this one bill last year. So some of this is, you all know, because you're experiencing this. What's driving the sur surplus? Frankly, the economic devastation wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. And we've had such a robust recovery that um, there's just uh, healthy tax revenue in general. New fee revenue, and a lot of what we're gonna talk about today is fee revenue, including fee revenue that isn't sheltered under a Tabor enterprise and is part of what drives the refund. And then there, there's new, ta new tax revenue at the state level because on the tax side, they've changed some tax policies that are increasing their overall, um, their overall revenue picture as well. Uh, I copied this from the June uh, revenue forecast um, uh, by the Legislative Council staff to graphically show you, I, I think it's a pretty cool graphic um, that shows this dynamic of where 
if the state adopts a lot of new fees and the fees are have to be included under their Tabor cap, the cash funds at the bottom of this glass, that, that number, that, that level grows higher. It squeezes the general fund uh, allotment of state money and causes Tabor refunds to come out the top. The Tabor refunds all come out of the general fund and it squeezes out all sorts of general fund purposes for expenditures. When you keep pumping a lot of money into that cash fund layer at the very bottom. And this is exactly one of the things that Douglas Bruce intended when he wrote Tabor originally was you can't go wild with fees because fees will only drive more revenue obligations. Sure, you don't have to vote fees, but if the fee of revenue is not sheltered, uh, rampant fee growth will drive higher Tabor refunds to taxpayers, just as depicted on this graphic from our friends at the state. So uh, uh, they're on a pickle and watch for a lot of conversation about this next year when they reconvene about how, how to deal with ever increasing Tabor refunds at the state level. Okay, here we go in terms of uh, one of the biggest things we want to do a little bit of a deep dive on here uh, and uh, affects some municipalities in the entire state in so many different ways. Um, I call it transportation funding and greenhouse gas reduction because that's one of the truly unique things about this package. Every other transportation funding measure I've seen in all my 40 years in Colorado has been about building stuff, right? But this bill is heavily, heavily freighted with a lot of things that aren't about building highways and transit systems. It's about uh, environmental concerns, um, you know, primarily through electric vehicle conversion, but also through just encouraging people not to drive, right? So uh, this very complicated bill um, is, is like no other ever in the history of Colorado in terms of how much ground that it covers. I put an asterisk by 5.5 billion because that's not really true. This was in all the headlines. They rarely said that's a 10 year number approximately. And in fact, the fees don't sunset. The revenue sources don't sunset. They're indexed uh, in, in, under various uh, formulas to increase through the years, right? So whenever you've seen that $5.4 billion number for this, describing this bill, it only tells part of the story. Um, the bill will potentially generate billions more in revenue over time uh, for the purposes we're going to talk about here. Um, quickly to highlight a few things in it for you, you're going to see more HUTF revenues in the future, not this year, but beginning next year, next fiscal year, uh, you'll begin to see uh, uh, marginally more. I put 43 million in here as a starting number, but actually that number is going to go up because the fees that will flow uh, to local governments will uh, be going up in the future as well. The, uh, the, uh, another major feature of this bill that hasn't been talked about very much is uh, dramatically expanded ease and authority to create regional transportation entities, which your cities might be involved with. Uh, it, it allows the old MPOs, metropolitan planning organizations like Dr. Cog and others to easily convert over to being regional transportation authorities with their own taxing authority to do even more regional enhancements to transportation. And I expect to see a lot of activity on that front in the coming years. And then a lot of this money is just going to flow to your benefit of your municipalities. Uh, electric vehicle charging stations will show up in your communities as a result of some of the enterprise expenditures in this bill. Um, fleet conversion from uh, internal combustion to electric vehicles. Municipalities and other government entities will qualify for grant funds under this law to do outright conversion of fleets over to electric vehicles. Numerous other examples in the bill of how your municipalities will potentially benefit from some of these programs. Uh, now, I'm going to get kind of uh, especially legalistic on some of this now because of this related to this bill and a couple of the others. We learn so much as municipalities from what the state does uh, in, under Tabor, uh, under other fiscal constraints. We learn from them, they learn from us. And so some aspects of this bill, we attorneys say, we can model things that they did and maybe apply some of these models to our own community, whether it's transportation or other things. So that's why I'm going into this in a little bit of depth. Um, the, here's the new fees that you've been reading about in the newspapers, uh, in the media, the social media, about what the bill actually does in terms of this new panoply of 
new state fees. Some of them are pay at the pump fees, just like gas taxes have always been. And some of them are very creative in terms of the new areas listed here. I mentioned on the slide that the retail delivery fee, the Amazon, UPS, uh, FedEx, and so forth, is actually in the bill, it's seven distinct fees. It's not one fee, it's seven different fees, which all go in seven different directions. And there's a legal reason that they did it that way. And I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, but uh, again, you all have been hearing about uh, fundamentally where the, the new world of fees is going to be in all those various categories. Um, now, here's a point I was making earlier about the uh, Tabor refund obligations at the state level. Only about half of the new fee revenue is sheltered in enterprises and not subject to the Tabor caps at the state level. But the other half uh, goes into what are more generically called cash funds. And the HUTF is a big example of this that, that are subject to the Tabor and Ref C cap. Ref C being their measure back in 2005 that actually tweaked the, in the normal Tabor cap in a big way. Uh, and we won't go back and retread that again. But, but here, here's, here's the point I was making earlier. Some of the new fee revenue will drive overall state revenue subject to Tabor, some of it won't. These are the new enterprises, and here are the categories that emphasize the point I made a second ago. Uh, what's in parens is the most important part, not the name of the enterprise. Electric vehicle charging infrastructure, conversion of fleets to electric vehicles, conversion of transit to electric vehicles, and something just happened. Um, can we go back one? Uh, let me do that. Um, and then and then this fourth category of enterprise, I just say reduced driving in terms of in the uh, part of the state in particular that has air pollution, uh, non-attainment problems, just programs to reduce driving in general is a function of that fourth enterprise. Uh, the largest recipient of the new fee revenue is not the new enterprises, it's an old, the old Colorado Bridge enterprise that was created back in 2009. And there was absolutely a strategic reason why they uh, went backwards and put a lot of fee revenue in a pre-existing enterprise rather than creating a new one. And I'll come to that again in just a few minutes. Um, so here's some teachable uh, legal issues in terms of uh, what's happening in this bill that I commend to the attention of everybody in the audience, especially the attorneys, city managers, and finance directors, and so forth. Um, uh, once again, this bill is a, whole, a huge adventure in knowing the difference between a fee and a tax. And everything in the bill is structured very, very carefully to be a fee that does not require voter approval instead of being a tax. And the one of the amazing things, this, this case that Aspen won a couple of years ago in the Colorado Supreme Court, it's just a little grocery bag fee just a, it's just a, a small program in one of our prominent mountain communities, but it becomes the legal foundation for a multi-billion dollar fee program at the state level. The Aspen case is cited multiple times in the bill as legal authority for the fees in this bill. But one of the things we see, um, again, for, especially for the attorneys, I've been singing off this page for a while, is that there are really two kinds of fees out there, user fees and regulatory fees. The Aspen case was a lot about kind of a regulatory program in Aspen supported by the fee there. And some of the bill quotes that, like all the new electric vehicle stuff is supported by what they're calling more of a regulatory fee theory in the bill, okay? But others like the pay at the pump, you know, that is pretty much like the old gas tax or the old diesel fuel tax. They talk about that more as if it's a kind of user fee. For every gallon you pump, you're gonna be out there using the roads. And they use some of that language of user fees as they have in some other Supreme Court and Court of Appeals cases down through the years. So there's a melange in the bill in terms of both fee theories being in play. Whenever your municipalities are setting out to adopt a new fee, kind of intellectually get yourself in the space of what kind of fee is it? Is it the one or the other? And then look back at this bill and see how they they applied applied it in practice in terms of all these new transportation uh, and electric vehicle fees. Uh, of course, the other thing to qualify the enterprises that they needed to do was all the new enterprises, they need to meet, meet the definition of a government-owned business. And this is kind of an interesting issue. The courts haven't delved into so much, but what makes something a truly business-like 
to qualify as a Tabor Enterprise. I quote some of the old language from 25 years ago uh, where the court kind of laid out the script for this back in one of the original Tabor cases. But um, there's a lot of legislative declaration and findings about the business-like nature of each of the new enterprises. Also teachable for us in terms of when we're creating new enterprises at the municipal level. And finally, all the enterprises have to have revenue bonding authority to be an enterprise under Tabor. And frankly, that was something that wasn't talked about hardly at all when Senate Bill 260 was going through. What is the plan in terms of all the new enterprises? Are they actually planning to issue bonds? Is that kind of the concept? Uh, and what part of the new fee revenue stream is going to be used to secure revenue bonds? When the state created the bridge enterprise year to, years ago, uh, they did do a 30-year bond uh, secured by the motor vehicle registration fee revenue starting in 2009. They, they, they didn't just have token revenue bonding authority, they used it uh, at the Colorado Bridge Enterprise. Uh, and some of those, bond, those bonds were refunded and some of those are still outstanding. Uh, so I'll be really interested to see all this new fee package, how much of that eventually is gonna end up being part of financing packages for bonds issued by each of the new enterprises. A lot more to be said about that going forward. That's all the Tabor stuff. Here's the new stuff. Um, the, uh, last year, the voters approved this measure, Proposition 117, that says, uh, that says that in the future, when the state creates new enterprises, they got to put it to a vote. $100 million in five years, you got to put it to a vote. And notice this highlighted language. Revenue collected for enterprises created simultaneously um, serving primarily the same purpose shall be aggregated, aggregated for purposes of calculating this voter approval requirement, right? So uh, you know where I'm going with this, is that they had to craft all the new enterprises and fees in 260 to avoid voter approval under 117. Here's how they, here's how they did it. First, they put a lot of the fee revenue, not in a new enterprise, but in, in an existing enterprise, as I said. Second, they broke it up in terms of the other four new enterprises in a way that wouldn't, wouldn't exceed the $100 million cap. But this is the real critical part. They, they defined each new enterprise as serving a distinctive primary business purpose. So that highlighted language on the preceding slide would not be violated. Yeah, they're all in the same bill, but they serve a distinct purpose and so their revenue shouldn't be aggregated for purposes of triggering a Proposition 117 vote. Um, and, and then finally, they made sure that the fees coming into each enterprise, including the retail delivery fee, was a distinct fee. It wasn't the same fee as somebody else was collecting. It was a distinct fee funneled to a particular enterprise, again, to support that distinction between all the new enterprises being created. And that's all I'm going to say about 260 for now. I mean, we could probably devote a whole session to it, but but it, it absolutely, I think, towers above most of the other things that were adopted this year. And it's going to kind of be an ongoing saga um, as it continues to play out and as the revenue starts to flow in. Uh, so very briefly, turning to some other tax, uh, tax measures from this year. Um, big tax reform package described as being historic in terms of some of the things they were doing with state income tax in particular, and some other state taxes in these two bills. <clears throat> I'm only gonna highlight a couple of things that affect our audience and affect you all listening today. Um, one thing that these bills show again this year in a big way is that the state feels that they're able to change tax policy in a way that will demonstrably generate hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, uh, yet does not require a Tabor vote. Uh, and I cite a couple of the key cases that led to that, to that conclusion. Laurel and I field questions all the time from municipalities saying, we want to tweak our sales tax code in some way. And somebody's complaining that it ought to be voted under Tabor because it's going to produce more revenue. Well, just the fact that it's going to produce more revenue doesn't decide necessarily that legal question. And there's case law that talks about when a, when a voter approval requirement is triggered for a tax policy change and when it isn't. And this is just another big example this year of where the state enhances revenue in a way they've determined doesn't require a vote under Tabor and under the case law. And then the other thing at the bottom of this slide, um, one of these bills contain a significant expansion of the business personal property tax exemption. It's been around for a long time. It was 70, 7,900, I think it was. Now $50,000 in value is exempted 
for your equipment and your machinery and so forth in your businesses. This is a very much a populist small business measure. The governor supported it. I think a lot of our communities support this as well, particularly when we get back bills. So the state is going to say statewide $50,000 in business personal property is exempted. And if local governments lose revenue as a result of that, we're going to make, make up for it out of the state's fisc. We love it. And that's why I highlight that in that last bullet. <clears throat> the uh, uh, turning back to the world of Tabor again here for just a second. Um, the uh, the uh, you all are familiar with the fact that Tabor says uh, you can't have a mill levy above that for the prior year without a vote of the people. But uh, here we have a huge carve out from that rule that's been around since 1992. Generally, you can't increase your mill levies without a vote of the people. Um, uh, this year, uh, 211162 allows almost all of the school districts in the state to go back to restoring their mill levies to levies they had in years gone by, back when they debruced years ago, to restore levies to the time when their voters said, it's okay with us if you keep and spend all revenue derived from our existing tax rates. Um, and this bill allows um, uh, uh, school districts to go back to the future. The, the state is highly motivated to give school districts more taxing authority because the more they can raise locally, the less the state has to provide in terms of equalization funds and other support. So a, a hugely important thing for both the state budget and for your local schools who serve your communities. So this is going to be phased in over many years in terms of how this is going to work. But because this was dicey from a legal perspective, they actually went directly to the Supreme Court with, with an interrogatory and got approval um, of, of uh, 1162 directly from the Supreme Court in May. And I think there's some important, relevant, analysis in this Supreme Court decision for your municipalities about any situation where you've done a debrucing and you see you've said what we always say, debrucing based upon all revenue from our existing tax rates. What happens if for some reason in your community you, you did de decline your rate at some point and you want to restore it back to where it was before? There's more authority now for you to have, you have that ability to do it. Folks, if you've been smart through the years and you were going to do a temporary reduction in a tax rate, you would call it temporary. So it's clear that you'd be able to bounce it back to its original lay level later. Um, but now you have even more Supreme Court blessing for your ability to restore all tax rates as a result of the decision in this case. <clears throat> uh, and now I'm going to take a drink of water uh, while Laura Witt takes over our guru on sales tax. And I know that even more so than property tax, sales tax is your bread and butter. So Laurel, you take it away. Yes, happy to. Thank you so much, David. Um, and as a reminder, as David said at the top of the hour, we do have our Laws Enacted publication out. Um, it's available via email or on our website. But also, just so you know, it's in the little handout section on the right-hand control panel of this webinar. So if you want to access that, it's over there. Um, and as a reminder, we're going to give our CLE number at the end of this presentation. So for those attorneys who are looking for that continuing legal education credit, we'll go ahead and give you that information a little bit later. Um, so I'm going to dive into sales tax. I promise this is the last tax topic we're going to talk about for a little while before we move into some other topics um, from this session. So just a little bit of background on sales tax in Colorado over the last few years. Um, in 2017, the legislature uh, created this thing called the Sales Tax Task Force, and it's an interim committee that meets during the off session of the legislative session. Um, it was originally created to be repealed in 2020, but it's been extended to 2026. Um, and this task force is intended to look at state and local taxing structure and to make legislative suggestions. Um, the task force was created because Colorado has a very complex taxing system, um, and they're looking at it from a statewide angle, how we can make things more streamlined. Uh, we here at the League work with municipalities and the state to try and streamline taxes as much as possible while protecting municipal authority over taxation. So that's the sales tax task force. And then in 2018, as many of you guys know, um, there was a case released called South Dakota versus Wayfair by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and this case that said, in effect, the government could tax those who did not have a physical presence in the state, as long as that taxation did not overburden interstate commerce. Unfortunately for us, um, this case happened out of South Dakota, and South Dakota has a much less complicated taxing system. So we've been scrambling over the last couple of years to work on um, trying to make things a little bit easier for remote sellers, as we often call them, or those without a physical presence 
to remit taxes here in Colorado, both to state collected entities and to local collected entities as well. Um, so one of those things that we've been working on, you've probably heard a lot about in the last couple of years um, that I've spoken on repeatedly is this idea of a uh, single remittance portal. It's called the Sales and Use Tax System or SUTS. Um, and then this portal, the idea is that anyone who has multiple um, businesses in different parts of the state or, or um, outside of the state can go ahead and remit taxes to Colorado in, into all of those different entities in one location, the SETS portal that's available through the Department of Revenue. Um, out of this process, this creating the single portal remittance portal, out of South Dakota versus Wayfair, we've had several bills over the last few years, um, and, and we continue to work on this SETS system with the sales task, task force, um, which continues to meet. They had their first meeting this last week, um, which we're ongoing talking about how we can continue to make SETS a better system, both for the users who interface with it and for the municipalities and the state on the back end. Um, I'm happy to discuss this a little bit more, but I give you that background just to talk about the next two bullets a little bit more. So um, this first bill related to tax um, Senate Bill 21282, um, the name of it was the continuation of small business exemption. Um, and this idea is that in Wayfair, um, part of the reason that the US Supreme Court said it didn't burden interstate commerce is that it did not apply to businesses that had less than $100,000 worth of sale into the state of South Dakota. Um, and so we have this small business exemption as we call it here in Colorado as well. And they have extended that through February of next year. Um, so again, this aligns with Wayfair, we're supportive of this bill. Um, it's just as an FYI. Um, if this exemption does go away, it means a little bit more tax revenue, but then it also means a little bit more burden on interstate commerce. So it's something that we're keeping an active eye on. Uh, the next bill, um, this is House Bill 21-1077. Um, this is the creation of another state public body looking at statewide tax policy. Um, unfortunately, we, we this happened in the last couple of weeks of session. Um, we weren't really excited about this bill because we already have this task force. So this is another way the state's looking at taxing policies. Um, we were able to get a couple of, of our members on, on the task force that's underneath this committee. Um, and that is a representative from Arvada, Ezekiel Vasquez, and then, of course, um, from the town of Frederick, statutory town, Jason Myers, who's um, an attorney up there. And we thank both of them for being on this task force for us and, and for representing the municipal voice. Um, so that's the state of sales tax here in Colorado. And I'm going to move us on to marijuana. OK, so this is a really, oh, I pushed one too many times. Uh, this is a really big bill. Um, House Bill 21-13-17, regulating marijuana concentrates. Um, I call it regulating marijuana concentrates and more because it does much more than just regulating marijuana concentrates. Um, there are several things that it does. But I'm going to talk about some of the main ones. Uh, first, uh, there's this idea of tracking and maximum daily purchases, um, which is the provision that we will care most about as municipalities because it impacts us the most. So um, medical marijuana, right now or retail or uh, retail mar marijuana you can if you are a consumer go buy some from one store and then that same day go to a different store and then a different store so you're going outside of your maximum daily allowance by just hopping from store to store it's a provision we call looping and just this idea that somebody can go from one store to the next and get much more than the state allows so in order to combat this the state adopted some language in this bill um, which basically limits the amount of marijuana allowed to be sold. So for medical marijuana, it's eight grams if you're over uh, 21, 21 and older, and two grams if you're 18 to 20 years old. And then retail marijuana, of course, is only available for those who are 21 and over, so it's eight grams per day. Um, and so in order to track, to make sure that this jumping isn't happening, uh, the, the vendors are required to put the sales into this idea, this tracking system called the seed to sale tracking system, and to verify that somebody hasn't already bought their maximum for the day. Um, so this is kind of an ongoing discussion to see how it works. Um, it's a big change for the marijuana industry. Um, in addition to tracking and looping, we also have this idea of um, uh, medical marijuana for those who are under 21. So this bill really uh, was talking about youth diversion, which is very different than just regulating marijuana concentrates. So um, for those who are 18 to 21 year old, this bill added a bunch of requirements to those um, patients in order to get their medical marijuana. For example, it requires two doctors to sign off on their medical marijuana cards. Um, it also requires that that uh, patient come back every six months 
to one of those two doctors to like, you know, get verified. Um, and then additionally, it requires CDPHE to come before the legislature each year and report annually on the number of physicians who made medical marijuana recommendations and how many recommendations each um, uh, physician made. So it does a lot of like regulatory oversight. There's a there's also a study around potency um, and then also like testing potency and, and autopsies. So just kind of a lot of a wide range of things. Um, of course, in the last couple of weeks after that happened, a lawsuit has already been filed. So this lawsuit um, is is claiming that this bill is unconstitutional. The complaint touches on a bunch of different areas. Um, I have the complaint is linked in this Colorado politics article in this webinar. Um, so if you click on that, when you get the slides after this, um, you can see the, the full complaint there. But um, it touches on a bunch of issues, including procedural problems. It also touches on um, the two main things that I talked about, the uh, two doctor requirement for medical marijuana patients under 21, and then also the tracking system. Um, we think it does have a little bit of traction, so it's definitely a lawsuit to continue to watch. And then continuing on with more marijuana, other marijuana legislation that's not quite as uh, robust, um, but still important for us to know about. The first one is House Bill 21-1216. So this bill, um, starting July 1st, 2022, allows licensees to change uh, designation from marijuana from medical to retail and vice versa um, under certain circumstances um, and with regulations from uh, MED, which is the Marijuana Enforcement Division, the state licensing authority. So in, in this uh, switch around when they're allowed to, to switch from one to another, there was some concerns raised up about, well, um, are we sure this is feasible? What does this look like? So in the last couple of weeks of sessions um, before businesses can change, um, MBD is now required to conduct and present this feasibility study. So they're gonna have to go before the legislature next year to say whether or not this is you know, feasible and what it looks like. Um, and so we'll see if this bill will continue to move forward or if it'll change significantly next session. So it's definitely a bill to watch for next year. The other bill um, you see at the bottom is uh, Outdoor Cultivation for Adverse Weather Plans, House Bill 21-1301. It does a couple of things, but the main thing that we care about as municipalities is this um, outdoor cultivation of you know, the adverse weather plans piece. Uh, so they're uh, beginning in January 1st, 2022, outdoor marijuana cultivated cultivation operations um, can make reasonable and necessary actions under contingency plan to prevent or ameliorate crop loss. So the example I like to give, um, and this is one I've heard a lot from the marijuana industry, is when hailstorms come in. So if a hailstorm comes in and there's an outdoor grow, the hail will ruin the plants um, and it can cost the marijuana industry lots of money, um, which also in turn then costs us lots of tax revenue. So um, it's kind of, uh, we're kind of tied and parcel to that, but um, they originally just wanted to be able to just move their crops. Um, and for us, we don't want to see just, you know, this outdoor cultivation putting crops in their back truck and just driving away. And we don't know what happened or where it's going. Um, as you can see, this could be a problem. So what the state is planning on doing is for this next growing season, starting January 1st of 2022, um, is to have them file adverse weather plans with the state um, and then also let us know what those adverse weather plans are and the state will approve them. Starting the next year, January 1, 2023, local authorities can regulate and require approval of these plans. Um, so it's something to be aware of, um, to think about what is it you will and will not allow as far as um, moving plants or putting them in different locations or land use um, regulations. So this is definitely a bill to keep an eye on and, and something to start thinking about as far as um, how you want to go about regulating adverse weather plans. And then on to out of marijuana onto the world of liquor and beer. Okay, so this first bill, um, it's, uh, <laughs> sorry, it's extending takeout and delivery to 2025. So that's the name of the bill is, is extending this takeout and delivery that we saw during the pandemic. Um, we weren't surprised to see this. Originally, it didn't have a sunset date. And then as it went through the session, it got kind of scooted up. So we have about a four year plan um, before it sunsets. Of course, we expect that to be, to continue to move on. Um, as people have gotten used to this takeout and delivery method here in Colorado um, after the pandemic. But something else that was added the last couple of weeks of session was this communal dining piece. Um, and we call this a modification of premises. Um, but really what it does is it changes a little bit of how the liquor, um, the liquor licensing code is structured. So normally um, before this bill, what would happen is you'd have one license um, premises and they would be in control of their license um, area. So if there was like an outside area, they'd have to get that license and approved and only they could serve there. 
When communal dining lets two licensees come together and have an outdoor area, um, I would imagine so I'm like a walking mall. I know a lot of the municipalities on this call had um, places blocked off in the street so that um, restaurants and bars could have space for people to be outside and socially distance. So those kind of spaces can now be shared by two licensees um, and it allows them to have beer and liquor in those places. Um, so it does change, fundamentally change how we originally thought about license controlled license spaces. Um, and there is an opportunity for uh, local licensing authorities to be involved in this process and to approve it. So um, it's definitely something to look at. It's, it's kind of, these are both ongoing things related to the pandemic, um, ongoing policies that that the legislature wanted to keep doing. The other bill you see here is Senate Bill 2182. So wine festivals um, were something that only happened at wineries before this bill. And what it was is you'd have a winery, let's say down in Palisade, um, where there's the wonderful peaches that are coming out this year. They also have great wineries. So if you're out at a winery in Palisade, um, the wine uh, winery used to be able to file with the state authority to get these festivals. And what it was is you'd be able to come and start tasting and be able to buy um, bottles of wine that's made by that manufacturer. So it would allow people to come taste things and have this little like festival, but it was on, on site. Um, and then this year it expanded it beyond just wineries. It's now available to other types of liquor licensees, um, including uh, just like regular liquor licenses. Um, it's a little bit different than special events permitting. I have the uh, statute to special events permitting down below. It's different in the sense that special event permitting is only for specific types of um, applicants, such as nonprofits, municipalities, political candidates, whereas this is more for that licensee that's able to apply for these festivals. The other big difference is that special events permitting is for you know, like a one-time special event, whereas these wine festivals, which are now not just wine festivals, alcohol festivals, are for um, several events throughout the year. So I think it's up to nine events um, throughout the year that they apply for. And so they'll apply at the beginning and then um, they have to let the municipality and the state know when they're going to be doing it, I think 10 days in advance. So um, just a little bit of a difference there. It allows for more ability for the um, alcohol licensees to have these kind of festivals. Um, something to keep an eye out for too is that locals can permit, require permits for these. Um, so that's something to look into if you want to permit it or um, have some sort of restrictions on it, I would definitely look into this bill. All right, so changing gears a little bit, we're moving to elections. The first thing I wanted to talk about was ranked choice voting. Um, this has become a common phrase in, in the media and other places. It's also called instant runoff voting. Um, and what it is is this idea of when you go to vote, instead of uh, just checking a candidate or, or maybe checking a couple out of you know, a whole range of candidates, you rank them. So you go first, second, and third. Um, and when they go to to compile all of the elect electorates and see who won, if any, if there's no one over that 50% threshold, they will continue down to the second voting and um, just continue down that way. So it just changes how elections are counted. It also changes how the voter interacts in the electoral process. Um, you've probably seen that it's come up a lot recently in the media, but just to throw a little fun fact in there, this is that actually a new idea. Um, the first instance of ranked choice voting goes back to 1911 to the city of Grand Junction um, here in Colorado. They put it in their home rule charter to do ranked choice voting. They uh, decided to get rid of it a couple of years later due to a couple of incidences, but um, this is something that's been around for over 100 years, which is kind of cool. Uh, so here, this particular bill, House Bill 21-1071, um, this was initiated because, the, because of the city of Boulder. They had a charter amendment that allowed um, ranked choice voting for mayoral candidates um, and they needed uh, a bill to be able to interact with the county and, and county elections. So um, this bill came forward to allow for ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting. Um, the bill starts in January 1 of 2023 for those cities who are in one county. If you're in multiple counties, the bill doesn't take effect until July 1st of 2026. Um, so I know that several of the municipalities online are in multiple counties, so it's a little bit more of a delayed process. And that is um, because we're trying to get, we, the state has to get certified, um, the counties to be certified in their voting machines. Uh, so what the state is going to be doing is looking at different voting machines and deciding which ones will work for this first, second, third place voting system. Um, in addition, the Secretary of State will be creating rules for tabulation, reporting, canvassing, Etc. So they're going to be actively involved in this process and working with our municipalities and counties. Uh, so this is um, something that's that's really propped up a lot in 
And it's been mostly in some smaller towns, um, in the mountain towns especially. I know that like Telluride, for example, had it for a while. Um, but recently, we just heard news that Broomfield, um, the city and county of Broomfield, is headed to the ballot on ranked choice voting for both mayoral and city candidates, city council candidates. Um, it's a referred measure, and so we'll see. Um, maybe this will be a little bit more of a trend for some of our larger cities. All right. So the last election bill I just want to briefly mention is the election cleanup bill. It's the Senate Bill 21250. Most of the bill has to do with Title I elections. Um, so since we're more focusing on the municipal election, I'll just talk about the Title 31 changes. There's a small section at the very end of this bill um, that specifically is focused on Title 31 recall elections. It, for example, it removes the requirement to vote on the recall before choosing a su successor. Um, and this was stricken by a Colorado Supreme Court decision in 2013. But basically what was happening is um, they were requiring you to say yes or no, we want to recall this person, and then the next question you were able to vote on who you'd want to replace them. Um, instead of requiring you to do one or the other, you can you can go ahead and skip the recall and go straight to who you want the, to be the successor um, under this new change. Additionally, um, it allows recalls for appointed officials as well as elected officials. Um, sometimes a vacancy will occur on a city council where you have to appoint a new person and that um, individual can now be recalled. They were before, but this just provided a little bit of clarity. And then finally, um, there was a statute or an amendment to the statute that blocks recalls for those elected officials up for re-election or termed out within six months. We were seeing that a lot of this actually, um, somebody would be recalled and then they'd have to be voted on you know, a couple months later to be um, an office. And it costs a lot of money for a municipality or a municipality and county to run an election. Um, so we were trying to reduce that a little bit um, as if this person is going to be up in the next six months, then they are effectively being chosen whether or not they want to stay in office. So um, that's something that we wanted to focus on. Next up, we have open meetings and open records. Uh, so this first case um, affects all of us and it, it all the municipalities in the audience, specifically for the city manager or town administrator role. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of the court case. So apologies for getting a little bit legalese here, but I wanted to give you a little bit of background on why this um, has come to fruition. So um, in April, the Boulder Daily Camera filed a petition for cert, and that means they filed with the Colorado Supreme Court asking them to take this case. And the case was the Court of Appeals um, had said that the Colorado regents who had decided to not disclose all six of their finalists for the president's position, the one that went to Mark Kennedy in 2019. They said they didn't want to disclose it and the Court of Appeals said that that's okay. They, they, they didn't need to disclose all six of them. Uh, the Daily Cameras petition seeks to settle who's considered a finalist. So this idea of who is the finalist? Is it just Mark Kennedy? Is there is it all six candidate? Who is that? Um, for state and local government chief executive officer positions under the Colorado Open Records Act. So prior to this bill that you see here, the Colorado Open Meetings Law required a list of all finalists for a chief executive position to be disclosed to the public a minimum of 14 days before being appointed. Um, this is probably something that you guys are all familiar with, you know, having to, to give out the names and, and information. Um, CORE defined finalists as a member of the final group of applicants or candidates and further states if only three or fewer applicants or candidates for the chief executive officer position possesses the minimum qualifications for the position, said applicants or candidates shall be considered finalists. Um, so that was the core language that was in there. This statute actually strikes that last part um, and essentially allows the city to decide, the city or other public body, body to decide if they want to do a sole finalist or if you want to do more than that under CORA. Um, so it's something to continue to watch. We'll see what happens. Um, proponents for this bill, as I said here in this, in this slide, say the bill will encourage more applicants, more qualified applicants to fill the positions because they're not worried about their name getting out there, um, especially if they don't get the job. Um, but opponents say that there's going to be a lack of transparency and then um, it'll sh especially affect diverse candidates. Um, so there's both proponents and opponents on this. I think it'll continue to be um, something that gets discussed and litigated over the next several years as we hammer out the details of this bill. So something to watch. Um, oh, I forgot something on this slide. So there's one little bill that I didn't add on this slide that I should have. So that's definitely my fault. But I'm going to talk about it just briefly. This is House Bill 211025, and it's called Non-Substantive Emails Under the Open Meetings Law. So this act clarifies that the Colorado Open Meetings Law um, does not apply to email communication between elected officials when it's related to scheduling, uh, 
availability, forwarding of information, responding to an inquiry to a constitu constituent, or posing a question for a later discussion in a public meeting. Prior to this piece of legislation, we assumed emails that did not engage in interactive discussion of public business should never be considered a meeting under the OML, but this act really clarifies that and helps us to understand that. Um, the previous language talked about the idea of um, it not being really depending legislation or other public business, um, but there was a little bit of confusion about that, so it's a little bit clearer now. This bill was initiated um, was initiated by CML and the city of Fort Collins, who worked hard with us, so I just want to shout out to the city of Fort Collins. Thank you for working on this with us, and um, we're excited to see that put forward and to help our cities. Okay, now moving on to workers' compensation. Um, so the pandemic put this pressure on workers' compensation, both on unemployment benefits, but just on workers' compensation in general. Um, as you all know, there was a lot of a lot, a lot of Coloradans who are not employed during this time um, who needed that that help. But then there was also a lot of questions about what it looks like to be working in in a pandemic situation. Um, so because of that, we have a, quite a few bills that have focused specifically on workers' compensation, which I'm going to talk about. The biggest one is the Act Cleanup, the Workers' Compensation Act Cleanup, House Bill 21 that you see listed here. Um, it had a bunch of changes, so I'm going to look at my notes and tell you all of them just so I don't miss them. But I'm sorry to do that. But there's quite a few changes here that include things like time frame limits on injured working claiming mileage reimbursement. So you know, if somebody's claiming mileage reimbursement, they can't wait, you know, a year to, to claim that um, money back. Um, it prohibits the reduction of an employee's benefits based on apportionment and kind of does a lot of changes to the apportionment section of the statute, um, including switching that uh, to, to the employer insurer that bears the benefit of proof of a, uh, an apportionment meeting. So there's a little bit of changes to that section. Um, it also modifies and adds conditions that must be met to request the selection of an independent medical examiner when uh, treating when the treating uh, physician has not determined that the employee has reached maximum medical improvement or MMI. It lowers the whole person impairment rating uh, for combined temporary disability and permanent partial disability caps and then prohibits an employer or insurer from withdrawing an admission of liability over two years unless there was a showing of fraud. So it does a lot of things to benefit the employee. So if this is an area of law that you um, work in with employment, I would definitely check out this bill. There's a lot of like minor changes that um, could affect your current practices. In addition, um, you'll see the overpayment of workers' compensation. This just is, as, doesn't apply to us as much, but just as an FYI, um, House Bill 21 1207, what it, what it does is sometimes somebody will get paid the over what they are qualified for for workers' compensation benefits. Um, maybe that's the system overpays it. Maybe it's a result of fraud or other things. So this changes the narrows down the number of reasons that somebody has to pay that money back. Um, for fraud and a couple of other things, but um, it just narrows it down. So it's not like if you get overpaid, you have to pay it back. It's if you get overpaid for these reasons, then you have to pay it back. So somebody keep an eye on if you um, have to deal with, with that. And then I wanted to touch a little bit on this choice of doctor bill because we think that it may come back next year and it's something that I want to talk about a little bit. This is Senate Bill 21197. It did not pass, but again, it may come back next year. So under current law, when someone's injured on the job, uh, the worker's employer or worker's compensation insurer is required to provide a list of designated um, physicians that they can go see um, if they're injured uh, to, to do treatment and to talk about next steps moving forward. This bill, um, which was eventually postponed indefinitely, um, would have allowed an injured worker to choose their doctor from a list of um, any level one or level two accredited physicians. Um, Tanama, it basically turned into doctor shopping. Um, during the legislative process, amendment was added that allowed them to continue to change their doctor up and until when they have to go back to work. So um, if somebody was saying, hey, you need to go back to work, you're qualified, they could go to a different doctor and change that. So um, it really wasn't a great process for us. Um, it ended a bunch of significant negotiations that we've done over the past years, and it lowered, it also really badly lowered the, qual the qualifications of types of doctors qualifications that a doctor must have in order to qualify for the list. So um, that's just something that to keep an eye on. Um, it would have resulted in, in some issues with workers coming back to work after uh, this ability. So the last subsection I'm gonna talk about before turning it back over to David to talk about some exciting issues such as policing. So you'll wanna stick around for that. But the last issue I'm gonna talk about is immigration. So this first one is, um, I'm calling for the lawful presence. Um, so overall immigration is more um, leaning towards immigration-friendly legislation, um, which is a little bit of a reversal from where we've been in the past. 
Uh, so these following bills that you'll see here require the removal of lawful presence requirements. Um, so this first one is the one that will affect us as municipalities the most. This is Senate Bill 21-199. Um, so just a little bit of background on this. In 2006, the legislature passed a bill that required, quote, lawful presence for public benefits, including professional, occupational, commercial licenses, which went above and beyond what the federal law required. Um, so our lawful presence was much more than, than just what the federal law required for certain benefits. Um, this, of course, in this session is a complete 180. As you see, it's removing lawful presence. Um, so as of July 1st, 2022, public entities, including municipalities, can no longer require lawful presence for any benefit. Um, so this is, it's just a reversal from what we've done before, um, something to pay attention to, to look at and make sure that you don't have lawful presence as part of your requirements. Um, there is a really big question lingering here um, that David and I were talking about recently, and that's this preemption issue for home rule municipalities. Um, the 2006 version was intended to be preempted, but it still remains like, can we say, you know, if we wanted to impose a citizenship qualification on a locally funded benefit, could we, locally funded, not state funded, could we say that home rule overrules it? Could you still do it? Um, it says in the bill that the statute applies to any public benefits that are distributed by a state agency, political subdivision, or home rule municipality. So it seems to preempt us, but there's just a little bit of a question there, especially for the locally um, funded benefit. Um, and then the other two bills, these are the, or the other, yeah, the other two that I have listed here, for many public or assisted housing benefits, you have to remove lawful presence unless it's required by federal law. And the last one from any local or state regulated professional license and certification or, or registrations. So trying to get rid of lawful presence. And in a related note, um, kind of similar, something to, to go back and look at all your contracts and just make sure that you don't have the term illegal alien in there. Um, so the state has required us now to change the term illegal alien to worker without authorization. And this term means someone who is unable to provide evidence that they are authorized by the federal government to work in the United States. It's a little bit more narrow um, and also they want to get rid of that, that terminology. Um, so again, something to like look at your contracts, look at your um, public benefits and just make sure that your uh, terminology lines up well there. The last bill I'm gonna talk about is U visa certification reform. So this is House Bill 21 So U visa um, is if an immigrant comes and is either a victim of a crime or a witness to a crime, and is being helpful in the investigation of that crime, of certain qualified crimes, then they can apply for what's called a U visa. Um, a U visa is uh, filed, and then what happens is it goes to um, the agency that they're helping, the DA, or we call them local certifying agencies or certifying agencies, um, such as the local police department, which includes municipal police departments, which is why I say this affects us, and something to pay attention to for your police departments. Um, they send it to that particular agency, and the agency signs off on it, sent to the federal government. The federal government only has so many that they can do each year, um, so they're limited there. But what was also happening is there was a backup from the local certifying agencies. Um, they would have a stack on their desks of all these forms that they had to fill out, and it was getting backed up, and it was really slow. So this bill was intended to speed up that process. Um, so now the, the timeline requirements are um, until June 30th, 2022, um, you have to have a 120 day turnaround on processing these forms and processing means either signing or not signing, deciding to sign or not signing, um, except in certain circumstances where it's 60 days and that, that includes things like threat of deportation. And then after July 1st, 2022, the timeline shrinks to 90 days. So you have to sign within 90 days, except in those certain circumstances, it's within 30 days. So they're just shrinking down the timeline to try and get these processed a little bit faster. But additionally, the bill creates various limitations on what a law enforcement agency may consider when signing these forms. Um, and the agency may not give out any personally identifying information or PII about an applicant except to comply with federal or state law. Um, so this is a pretty big one in the U visa process. So if you um, are part of the police or you advise police or anything like that, I would definitely check out this bill because it changes things. Um, all right, so we are transitioning back onto preemption and I'm going to hand it back over to David. Uh, thank you, Laurel, for all of that good information. Um, so uh, I'm going to cover a couple of other topics and then we'll turn to the uh, police and criminal justice here in just a moment. Um, you know, this is kind of a mega trend over the last couple of years that some historic decades old preemption laws have been partially released 
by the General Assembly in the current politics of the day. And a couple of these you remember from two years ago, oil and gas regulation, uh, there were additional local authority, minimum wage, additional local authority. Um, th those were from 2019. And then this year, um, uh, relief in the area of rent control, plastics, firearms, we're going to talk about here for just a second. But here's the key thing. Every single one of these bills is just not a clean repeal of the old preemption. They always come with caveats and catches, right? And that's what I'm going to focus on in the next couple of slides. And the other thing that I know many of you have identified in, in some of your communities, these bills always relieve preemption, allowing us to be more strict, but not less strict than state law. They always kind of uh, constitute a one-way street in terms of how much local authority is, is truly uh, conferred uh, by, the, by this legislation. <clears throat> so uh, this was a, a big victory for CML this year, and uh, Megan Dollar in particular, yeah, I could tip of the hat to her on all of this, but, but particularly on this bill, and I, I was pleased to help out with a little bit too. Um, the old uh, rent control uh, preemption law from the early 1980s, uh, this clarifies that certain kinds of municipal land use regulations are not rent control. They're land use regulations, they're not rent control, uh, in, in, including inclusionary zoning and the ability to require developers to do affordable um, uh, or workforce housing set-asides as part of new development. But the catch, as many of you probably know, is that we couldn't just get uh, clean relief from the preemption. Uh, we had to have a couple of important caveats. It only authorizes local ordinances that give developers a choice of options to meet the affordability requirement. I know that a lot of these ordinances already do anyway, uh, so that's really not that big a deal, but it really means you can't absolutely require on-site delivery of the affordable units with no exceptions, right? Uh, there has to be flexibility, flexibility built into the ordinance. Um, and then uh, this came about during the sausage making, uh, intense negotiations with the governor's office about his desire to see this extra wrinkle that you can't have an ordinance for inclusionary zoning unless you're doing something else in your land use policies to increase housing affordability and to increase density. Um, and that the notion is you can't just rely on, a, on dwelling unit set aside, you need to be doing more. Well, the municipalities I know all over Colorado are doing more, but they wanted this actually written into the statute. And so this, this language showed up uh, during the negotiation over the contents of the bill. And I'm gonna come back to uh, so that kind of land use issue here in just a second. Um, the, um, uh, uh, the next big uh, historic change uh, this year was the relief on plastics preemption that occurred way back in 1989. I remember it well uh, when they passed a law saying that local governments cannot regulate packaging, uh, plastic packaging uh, per se, uh, when they adopted that 1989 law. So that got lifted, but it got lifted in the context of a bill that adopts an overall statewide law, uh, particularly on um, uh, bags uh, in retail stores, grocery stores, and uh, polystyrene products with takeout food and so on and so forth. So in this case, the catch is one thing, the preemption isn't lifted for three years, that's, that's one catch. Uh, secondly, this whole new state scheme, we get to enforce it. Um, the bill started out with some notion that some state authorities might be involved in the enforcement, but as it went through the process, the fiscal note process, if you will, uh, the final versions of the bill basically say, there's a new statewide standard for containers and bags, uh, but the enforcement's going to be local, um, uh, essentially, is the way the bill ended up. And there'll be some responsibilities in terms of that kind of devolution. And then we, we've noted, we've been talking about how the 16 municipalities that already had bag laws, I think there's going to have to be some interesting discussion in each of those communities about how they're going to dovetail their local requirements they've adopted over the last 10 years with the new state regime, right? Or, is it, are they going to be reconciled? Are they going to be one on top of the other? Um, how's that going to work in those 16 municipalities? We're going to be enjoy watching that um, shake out over the next couple of years. Obviously, uh, an incendiary issue, uh, always controversial issue of firearms regulation. Uh, I was involved in 03 and the original preemption bills that were adopted back then, including some litigation back in those days. Uh, that essentially the laws from 03 set up the standard statewide concealed carry permitting, took it away from police uh, 
chiefs, gave it to county sheriffs, standardized where you can go with your concealed firearm with a permit. There was all of that, plus the, the rule that cities cannot have stricter laws than the state. Uh, it's been a subject of litigation back then, subject of litigation recently in the city of Boulder. Um, but here we have a partial relief of the preemption from years ago. The catch, um, local governments still can't adopt laws that con conflict with a state prohibition of some sort. And so I give this big example on the slide. There was a law adopted 20 years ago that said everybody has a right in Colorado to travel with a gun in their vehicle for personal self-protection. No permit required. You have a right to travel around the state with a firearm in your vehicle as an adult uh, for personal protection. And local governments can't stop you from doing that, right? So that's an example of a law that cannot be superseded by a new municipal ordinance under the authority of 256. But more importantly is this last one. A local ordinance cannot be enforced against a person who neither knew or should have known about the existence of the local ordinance. And is this the exception that swallows the rule? Because normally ignorance of a, of a law is not a defense, but this bill was amended during the process to say, yeah, actually, if you didn't know and you couldn't have known, uh, then you have a complete defense to being cited and prosecuted under, uh, under a local firearms ordinance that differs from state law. So I think that's going to be significantly challenging in those municipalities that want to adopt additional local regulations to deal with that last sub bullet here on that slide in terms of uh, whether it's going to be effectively prosecutable. Um, and then finally, we've been talking about bills that lifted preemption. Here's a new preemption that came about this year, and we may see more of, of this sort of thing in the future is what my crystal ball is telling me right now. This is a bill that sailed through the legislature saying to every county, every municipality, essentially you have to treat uh, residential child care facilities, which is a facility run by the resident, up to 12 kids um, in, in the home. You have to uh, treat them the same as essentially basic residential uses in your community. And I know a lot of you have all kinds of prohibitions, restrictions, permitting requirements, and so on and so forth. I'd say this is the one bill this session that requires everybody to be checking their zoning code to see if you comply with this new preemption just imposed upon us this year. Um, and uh, old timers in the audience remember the old group home laws uh, years ago that did something similar to this. It said there has to be some accommodation for group homes in your residential neighborhoods, up to eight persons. This is similar to that, but I think actually more pervasive in terms of its preemption in some ways. So I hope you all are checking that out. The point I want to make here before closing this slide is that we expect to maybe see more state preemption on basic zoning and land use issues in the name of affordability, in the name of transportation land use interfaces, in the name of wildland prevention, wildfires. Um, the state appears to be particularly interested now in getting into local land use policies that drive these transcendent issues like the ones I just listed. Um, because obviously there's a land use component to, uh, to all the things I just mentioned. So watch for more discussions out of the, particularly out of the Polis administration and his departments and agencies about wanting to have a greater, at least communication between municipalities and the state over the way local land use affects statewide policies. Um, another significant theme in the current politics of the Capitol, starting in 2019 and continuing uh, up until this session as well, uh, just a lot more ways to sue municipalities, uh, a lot more theories under which to sue and collect damages. Obviously, the biggie last year uh, was the police liability, which we'll come to in just a second, but lots of other bills on this topic as well. And our, our lobbyists at CML work very closely with others, particularly business interests at the Capitol, because a lot of times these bills set up new ways to sue both public sector and private sector defendants, right? Uh, and so we kind of uh, join uh, forces with our uh, friends in the private sector in taking lobbying positions on these bills, but not entirely successfully lately because the trend has been pro-plaintiff in terms of giving aggrieved persons uh, uh, new and different ways to sue both public and private defendants. Um, now, a really a lot of headlines this year about the first two bills listed here. The ability uh, for people who are victims of child sexual abuse to sue their abuser and sue the employers of their abuser uh, going into the future. 
uh, no more statute of limitations, but more importantly, a look back provision that allows people to, uh, even before the effective date of these bills, to bring up things that happened before the law changed. And that is, uh, in my opinion, very problematical as applied to public entities. They, they're waiving governmental immunity for these kind of claims. Normally, any new liability imposed upon us is only for events and incidents occurring in the future. They can't constitutionally apply retrospectively to things in the past, but the, these bills purport to apply retrospectively and give a window of opportunity for plaintiffs to come forward now for things that might have happened before. This hugely affects school districts, but it can also affect municipalities because of your recreation programs, your youth programs, summer camps, and so on and so forth. Um, this is something that there's going to be this window, uh, particularly in the next few years, of additional liability claims coming up under these new laws. Um, also this year, they added to the state anti-discrimination laws gender expression, gender identity, on top of sexual orientation, basic old-fashioned sex discrimination that goes back to Title VII uh, from the, from the get-go at the federal level. Uh, now these new, new forms, these new categories of protected classes and discrimination claims are officially recognized under state law, even though they haven't been added to federal uh, anti-discrimination laws yet at this point, maybe in the future, but not quite yet. Um, another example of that, it's going to be easier now to sue under state law for government programs and services, similar to, uh, for, for disability discrimination. The main point in this bill, over the next couple of years, regulations are going to unfold about access to your city websites and doing business with the city through the website and making sure your websites are, are disabled accessible uh, and that you don't have a claim arising under uh, uh, House Bill 10, 1051 in the next couple of years. Watch for a lot more news about that uh, coming up. A big one that didn't pass, that may come back, is great, great interest on the part of some legislators to expand discrimination claims for hostile work environment, uh, which has been a theory that folks have been suing under for 30 years under federal law, uh, but the proposal has been to have a broader definition under Colorado for what you can be sued for. And, um, and uh, it's one of many issues we expect was defeated this year, but might come back next year. Okay, so now closing up my portion of the presentation with the large, large issue of policing and criminal justice. So the big bill this year was House Bill 1250, which uh, Megan Dollar and others on our staff spent so much time on. Last year, when 217 was adopted last June, it was introduced and adopted in about two weeks. And you remember how kind of frantic and intense that was in terms of the adoption of that bill. This one hung around all session and was the subject of a lot of negotiation between the sponsors, us, the law enforcement communities, DAs, police chiefs, police unions. And a lot of new things came out of the bill again this year. Some good things and some things that proposed more challenges. I'm only gonna talk about a few issues highlighted here we have a lot more coming. Uh, Megan and others are working on this to roll out additional information, working with our police legal advisors on a lot of new implementation challenges we, come, we, we see coming out of 1250 this year. Uh, a big one for the communities that already have body-worn cameras is that uh, some of the deadlines have been accelerated. And the biggie that your folks are dealing with right now in your communities that have body-worn cameras are the new requirements for uh, releasing the the, uh, the video, uh, when you have to release it, how you have to release it, how you may redact it, uh, all of this, all of those things weren't going to be coming into play for a couple of years under the bill last year, but now they're effective immediately. And there's a lot of scrambling and a lot of policy making going on about release of body worn camera video. Uh, also effective immediately is laws against tampering with the video. Uh, uh, we we knew that was coming, not as big a deal. The releasing the video is a big deal in terms of adjusting to that whole new world. Um, the, uh, the key thing though in the bill is that the cities that don't have body-worn camera yet, they still have the deadline of 7-1-23 in terms of when they will have to have it uh, if they don't already. Uh, <clears throat> I think we made a lot of progress this year and kudos to the folks who worked on this. One big thing last year was suddenly we were going to have to be collecting data and information every time the police contacted a member of the public 
uh, with a lot of ambiguity about what that meant and a lot of new workload associated with creating these new reports, eventually for sending them all to the state to create a statewide database. There were a lot of good clarifications, some narrowing uh, that occurred this year in 1250 and they're uh, set forth in some detail on this slide. But I do think we got some gains here in terms of understanding better what we're even supposed to be doing in terms of reporting police contacts. So again, uh, uh, hats off to those who uh, helped uh, make some progress on that, which was a, a lot of the buzz last, uh, last summer about that. Uh, civil liability was revisited in a way that continues to expand our duty as municipalities to indemnify officers who are sued for violating somebody's constitutional rights. Uh, now it's even possible to force the cities to indemnify if the officer actually committed a criminal act uh, in violating someone, someone's uh, constitutional rights. If the city was a causal factor, whatever that means, a causal factor in the commission of the criminal act by the individual officer, there's a duty to, to indemnify. This bill also famously uh, 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 clarified that cities can't uh, do, uh, do a blanket policy to indemnify officers even for their bad faith acts and so forth, uh, cities have to make a case-by-case -case determination whether to indemnify an officer for a claim that the officer acted in bad faith and not do blanket coverages. And then uh, uh, finally here, the release of completed internal investigation files. Uh, this goes back a couple of years, but the law was changed to require cities to give up, once a discipline and investigation is done, give up certain files, it was clarified this year that you can do blanket requests. You don't have to identify a specific incident. You can actually say, I want to see everything on this officer that was a closed file. I want to see everything over this time period that's in the form of, a, of, a, of an internal investigation file uh, related to actions by, uh, by the police department. Uh, more blanket requests, the door is open uh, on that front. There's still some questions around the edge, but it's clear from both the court decision a couple of weeks ago and uh, changes in 1250, those files are open for public inspection. Um, uh, 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 some other police bills adopted this year, I'm only gonna talk about the first one on this slide, uh, arising as you all well know from the Elijah McLean incident in, uh, in Aurora, um, the clamp down on the use of ketamine in the law enforcement setting, uh, this bill, creates new criminal liability for police officers, and see the term here, who unduly influence uh, EMTs to administer ketamine and ketamine in a law enforcement situation. I know our chiefs are very concerned about the ambiguity in that language uh, and what, what might be construed as influencing by the officer toward the EMT, and there continues to be great concern about how that's gonna play out in practice. Um, EMTs themselves have kind of pages of prescriptive requirements in the bill in terms of how and when they can administer ketamine. So there's a lot of operational impacts coming for that particular uh, issue uh, statewide as a result of that bill. And here's some other, other bills that uh, were let, got less publicity during the session that we also tracked and in some cases took positions on this year. Um, I want to finally, finally talk about these two uh, massive, hundred, hundreds of pages of uh, misdemeanor reclassification, uh, sentencing reduction for misdemeanors. Uh, they're coming out of the Colorado uh, Criminal Justice Reform Commission. Uh, and and I, I just highlight a couple of provisions from this. Again, it's part of the overall trend. The legislature in the current political climate is looking to reduce penalties. Um, and in this case, a lot of misdemeanors are downgraded, the, the maximum penalties are decreased, uh, and we understand there'll be a bill next year on felonies that will likewise, likewise decrease certain classifications and certain sentencing levels, and I'm expecting may bump some felonies down into the misdemeanor level. We'll watch for that bill next year. But a couple of points about this for you all to think of from a municipal perspective is that one of the huge things that 271 does it creates a new dividing line between property crimes, property crimes that are misdemeanors versus property crimes that are felonies. And it raises to $2,000 that threshold. So if it's theft up to 2,000, it's a misdemeanor. Over 2,000, it's a felony. 
if it's vandalism or criminal mischief, up to 2,000, it's a misdemeanor, over 2,000, a felony. A lot of you, you all in your municipal codes, you'll have a criminal mischief or, or petty theft that will have a dollar amount that your ordinance applies to. You now have the green light to reevaluate whether you want to change the dollar amount and have more tickets written into your municipal court versus having to be written into state court. So that's an opportunity if you want to look at that in your own municipal codes. And then finally, just kind of an anomaly to point out to you all is that in decreasing the maximum fine levels for misdemeanors, this bill actually did not pay any attention to the fact that the maximum fine level for municipal ordinances is now much larger than the maximum fine level for state misdemeanors. Uh, I don't know if the legislature will ever revisit that, but it is the way the law stands right now as a result of some changes that occurred a few years ago that gave municipalities much greater fine authority just uh, six or eight years ago. And then finally, an important one for our municipal courts, they completely eliminated the OJW system. This is a system that allows your traffic court, when somebody doesn't show up, when they don't pay their traffic ticket, your traffic courts are able to tell DMV that they didn't show up. A judgment or a warrant was issued and their driver's license gets held at the state level, suspended at the state level, until they go back to the court and either show up or pay their fine. That system has been in place for 40 years. Now it's gonna be gone as of January 1st. It, it, it allowed a lot of leverage for municipal courts to be able to get tickets paid, but now the system's going away. Um, uh, Boakler and Thomas on our staff managed to negotiate at least an ongoing conversation and study with the state about providing us new tools to be able to collect traffic tickets in our municipal courts if they're taking away the OJW system. And those discussions will be starting here, I think next month, um, in terms of finding some other leverage or tools to get those tickets paid. Okay, and then my final slide here is just, there's a, a lot of this represents things that didn't get passed this year, but we know almost certainly are gonna, are gonna come back up and be reintroduced again next year. And once again, this is a reflection of the work of CML's lobbying team, and uh, Megan Dollar, Dollar in particular, and others, it's police chiefs, the district attorney's council and so forth, has put a lot of effort into lobbying these particular issues, but we don't think it's over. And we know it's not over in terms of these issues. And that's, and you'll, these, these are familiar from the headlines, reducing arrest authority, reducing the authority to require cash bail, police actions in school settings against juveniles, um, uh, uh, community resource officers, uh, and arrests in general in school activities and school settings, limitations on police actions in response to protests and First Amendment activity, limitations on no-knock warrants. There's, uh, uh, 1250 called for an interim study of no-knock warrants, and we're almost certainly gonna see a bill next year that either limits or prohibits no-knock warrants entirely, limits on collection of biometric data like facial recognition, hardware, and so on and so forth that came up in a bill this year, but uh, but was defeated, was likely to come back. And then finally, kind of the, this big issue of uh, police use of force standards. You know, that's a big component of Senate Bill 217 last year. How much force is too much force uh, in terms of getting a, a police officer in trouble with his post certification, with his disciplinary sanctions, and potentially with criminal liability, how much force is too much force in a particular situation? If it comes back or when it comes back, What's for this de-escalation issue to be a major thing that the General Assembly wants to talk about? Whether there needs to be more express requirements in state law for de-escalation before an incident turns deadly. Um, and uh, that was a component of uh, one of the bills this session that went away, but is likely to come back. So that's what we're looking forward to next year. And uh, I, have no idea uh, if we have questions in the <laughs> in the question box, but we do have a few minutes um, for Laurel and I to uh, maybe address any questions. Also, the league lobbyists are in the audience, and if somebody asks about a legislative history type question, we might kick it to them. All right, David and Laurel, thank you so much. And just a reminder to our audience, if you do have a question for one of these two experts sitting here, please make sure to type it in 
for them so we can get that question answered before the end. Uh, we do have a few questions for you. Our first one is regarding the switch from illegal alien to worker without authorization. Is there any sense that the legislature will take up removing these requirements entirely next year, given the removal of the requirements on the public benefits? Yeah, that's a good question. And since I am not at the legislature, I think we can go ahead and call on our lobbyist friends. Um, so lobbyists, I know that there's a little unmute button there. I think this is Megan Dollar's topic. So uh, Megan, if you have any thoughts on what the legislature thinks about this, I do know that overall they're trying to move towards an immigration friendly um, uh, like things overall. But Megan, do you have any thoughts on that specifically? Um, I do. And actually this is Megan McKillop, so I'll actually oh. let her answer it. My fault. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> apologies the trash truck is going right by my house so if you hear that that's what that is um i um <clears throat> i don't know that how much more we'll see next session um i think 2022 is an election year and i think we'll see how the redistricting maps um kind of impact what bills are going to be brought forward um, in the 2022 session. So I think that's something to really keep in mind. Um, I do know, and David knows a lot more about the history of this and the federal implications of removing some of these requirements. Federal law has to be this, the kind of standard. So state, the state standard can't be more lenient than the federal standard, if I'm, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, David. Um, so there's not really any wiggle room unless there's more federal action on on that and if i can clarify that answer please or if i didn't answer the question completely please let me know and i can add more i'll quickly chime in on that the, the illegal alien issue is entirely in the context of a law that says you have to include in your services contract uh, a provision where the contractor promises you they won't hire illegal aliens well under state law, they're not supposed to be hiring illegal aliens or undocumented persons or whatever term you want to use anyway. So this is a little bit what Megan was saying is it was, it was almost one of those things from 2006 that was somewhat gratuitous, which is uh, our contractors and employers aren't supposed to be doing it anyway. Um, but but whether or not they choose to just purge, purge it from the statutes entirely, uh, I'm, I'm not sure either, but uh, it really was. Uh, was uh, not particularly substantive when they adopted it in the first place. Thanks, Megan. Courtney. Great. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Great, thank you both. Uh, our next question is, can you tell us what is going on with Metro districts and were there any bills on this topic? Uh, I think it, Laurel's going to make me talk about that. <laughs> there, <Just> like, <laughs> there, there was a major bill. I don't have it at the tip of my tongue. If a league lobbyist wants to come back in on this one as well, but the, but yes, there was one related to metro district transparency, uh, and it was fundamentally about just increasing reporting requirements and posting requirements and notice requirements, exactly like the title of the bill would indicate. And it was actually put together and sponsored by pro-metro district groups, folks who form metro districts, uh, the Special Districts Association. It was kind of coming from that perspective. And it wasn't like a crackdown on metro districts in terms of some of the headlines you've seen in the Denver Post over the last year that would make it harder to form metro districts or, or, or to conduct elections for metro districts. It was more about that uh, magical word transparency. Megan, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just add, so that was Senate Bill 21262, um, Special District Transparency. Heather Stoffer in our office followed it. Um, CML ended up taking a, a support position on it, um, specifically around the issue of dominant and eminent domain, and that a metro district would need to get, uh, please clarify if I'm wrong, <laughs> attorneys here, um, that they would need to get um, the buy-in of either the county or the municipality that they're in before engaging in dominant eminent domain. Um, I think that this would be one that we, even though that bill passed this year, there still could be more um, legislation in, in the future. And uh, I'd be surprised if there isn't, because I know that there's still advocacy groups that are seeking more uh, reform when it comes to metro 
districts. Thanks, Megan. Great, thank you so much. So our next one might be a little long, uh, so bear with me on this one. Oh no, excuse me, I'm jumping ahead. I, uh, pardon me, pardon me. I don't wanna forget other people here. Excuse me for that. Uh, so this one's actually for Laurel. So Laurel, can you answer if retail marijuana is included in the marijuana concentrates bill and if local tax revenue will be affected with the marijuana bill to allow people to change designation? Yeah, so um, I assume that the first bill you're talking about is the potency bill. That one does include retail marijuana um, as far as how many ounces you can get from the retail marijuana um, store. It'll be eight ounces per day. Um, as far as the designation one that goes back and forth, it does also include, um, it includes uh, the idea of switching from retail to medical marijuana. Um, I can't remember, so I apologize, and feel free, feel free to jump in if it goes from uh, medical to uh, retail as well. It's something that they're studying. Um, I do think that it could impact our uh, fiscal resources because we do have different tax amounts on medical versus retail, um, et cetera, and the medical is a lot more controlled by the Colorado Constitution. So it is something that could impact us um, in the long term. Actually, both bills could. Um, because if there's a restriction on how much people can buy at each location that means less tax revenue to you so um, we can see a little bit of a tax revenue change but again with that um, designation switching over they're going to do a feasibility study and they are going to include looking at um, local governments and how that would impact us as well so that will be in part of the MET uh, feasibility study David did, did I get did you have anything to add okay no. great and both if you feel like jumping on feel free to but otherwise Okay, it does. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question. Uh, so this one is, uh, what if a city chooses not to enforce the bag fee, but stores are collecting the fee? Do cities and towns still have to develop a system for stores to remit the fee? I'm going to mostly duck the question because I, it's a great question uh, about cities that don't don't choose to to devote enforcement resources, whatever. But, but the law requires the business to collect the fee and to remit it to the local treasurer. Uh, so, so it's something the law tells them they have to do. Uh, and so the law doesn't contemplate an option where you don't take their money or you, don't, you kind of blow it off. It assumes you will take the money. Uh, yeah, and, and a portion of it they get to keep, a portion of it they have to remit to the local authorities. So, so it, it, during the fee phase of the bill, so to speak, uh, that 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 money is going to be flowing in with the expectation that the money will be used, I think, for enforcement. So, so, so it, I, I understand where that question's coming from, but from the language of the bill, it really doesn't contemplate a scenario in which uh, in which you can opt out, you know, and either kind of by law or de facto, you, you're, you're, you'll be involved because that money will be flowing into your treasury. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a few more questions. Uh, this one is for Bo Green, and it's asking about working on getting the, uh, or the tools that you're using, excuse me, for getting uh, tickets paid. Uh, this, uh, of Alicia Garcia is wondering if there might be a conversation to include referral to collection agencies, uh, for example, statutory cities, that may be a useful tool for them. Uh, Alicia, for example, has not researched the authority for a, a statutory city to use a collection agency. The authority may already exist, but in case it does not, this may be a useful tool. Yeah looking for the mute button but i found it yes um alicia i think that's a really great question i know that we have been talking about um the widespread utilization of collection agencies uh, i do believe that um cities have this authority but david please correct me if i'm wrong the task force will begin um i believe in september and so once it begins we'll be able to utilize these tools but or think about these tools but as of now the task force hasn't convened, but I'm happy to reach out to you directly to start to discuss the tools that 
the task force is, con is considering. All right, thanks, Bill Green. Uh, we'll, we have two more questions. This one is asking if there were any limitations on when a law enforcement officer can turn off a body cam camera. Yeah, sorry, during an investigation. Uh, and short answer is yes. Uh, there are. There's a lot of detail in the bill from last year uh, that talks about when it has to be on and when it can be turned off. Uh, and so the answer is yes. And this is what your police legal advisors are working so hard on in terms of uh, interpreting that language to make sure they stay on the right side of the law. Um, but the short answer is yes. And then there's uh, there, there's provisions in there about redacting for privacy sake. Uh, some of the uh, uh, images or sound that may come from a body camera video. This is something else that, that uh, we're wrestling with in terms of understanding that language. So, so it's not black and white. It's not clear cut, always on, always off. There's, there's all kind of fine distinctions as well. Great, David. Thank you so much. And one more sort of under that same umbrella. Uh, this one is asking what kind of lawsuits have been filed under 217 so far and if there have been any outcomes yet the, the, the uh, no outcomes yet uh, the one big one we're following there may be others around the state uh, other, I, I know a number have been threatened but the big one we're following was an arrest in um, in aurora in late summer of last year it was a mistaken identity, uh, license plate numbers got confused and so forth. And it was arrest and an arrest in a commercial parking lot of a woman and her family uh, where they're claiming various constitutional violations uh, because of how it all went down. Um, and that that is one that was filed in state court, citing 217, filed under the state constitution, uh, and is kind of like the tip of the spear in terms of the big one that we know about. Um, but. Uh, there may, there may be others we just haven't taken notice of yet. Way too early to tell about trends in 217 liability, what standards the courts are going to use, that sort of thing. We're still way too early to tell, even though we're a, a year after the adoption of the law. All right. Thank you so much. That was our last question. Uh, so at this point, we're going to hand things back to Carrie. Yes, and the next slide should have our CLED number on. 